want to welcome you guys to our worship service this morning as uh, today's a special day. We're having our Christmas program today, so we've got some people that'll be coming up here and sharing with us. Um, I'm not going to announce them before they come up, so when you see your name in the bulletin for when you're going to share your gift, just come on up and uh, share your gift with us. But uh, before we start off, and before we jump into our first congregational hymn, let's prepare our time together by going to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and I thank you for this morning that you've given us to be able to worship you. I thank you for special days like this where we can have folks within the congregation come up here and sing or share a poem or a reading or whatnot. Lord, we thank you for the church. We thank you for this church. We pray now, Lord, that this time together this morning is a time of rejoicing. We pray our time together is a time where we are drawn into worship of you, that whatever we came here with, heavy on our hearts with, or, or our minds, that those are set aside and our focus is on you. You are worthy. May you be glorified throughout our time together this morning. And I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to sing our first congregational hymn together. So if I could have you do that. seated. I'm calling my little citation, Fear Not. Just as the angel said to the shepherds, Fear Not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, 
who is Christ the Lord. That's from Luke 2.10. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. God gave us the Holy Spirit that lives within us. God said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus Christ said, ask and you will receive. We are blessed to live in a land of faith where all things are possible. Our limits are those we place on ourselves. Let us pray, pray for courage and wisdom to pursue God's justice and peace. Pray for the future of our children, grandchildren, and yes, even for our great-grandchildren. Give thanks for the miracle of life of creation and for the grace of the Almighty God. Pray for godly leadership who pray and seek God, who keep their Bibles open, their knees bent, and have the desire in their heart that God bless the United States of America. Amen. Good morning. Norma and I are going to be playing and singing Christmas, and I will sing through the first time, and if you all want to join me, you can have the words up on the screen for you guys to join in for the second time around. For the Christ child who died for us Ages for the heavens above R is for the righteousness he teaches us I is for his image we love S is for the strength he sends I just wanted to let you know, uh, my name isn't Sandy. <laughs> just in case you were wondering what's going on. But, uh, let me see if I can tilt this a little bit. Actually, I'm a sort of a fill-in, and I talked to Pastor later this week about doing something. And I'm not going to sing, so don't worry, okay? 
But I thought I would share with you, and I got to do it very briefly, uh, just one of the episodes in my darlings of my life where the Lord led us. But it all started in December of 1973 when I came to know the Lord. I was uh, 31 years old at that time. And my wife had come to know the Lord three and a half years prior to that. And it was through her witness in my life that helped me to come to know the Lord. A year and a half after I came to know the Lord, we headed for Chicago to go to Moody Bible Institute. Uh, that was a big change for us. And uh, I quit my job, which was a very good job, and sold our home, packed up the U-Haul, and drove to Chicago. And we found an apartment, or actually it was a house, that we thought we were going to live in for a while, and when we found out that didn't work, so we had to move into a two-bedroom apartment with another couple that had... A boy and a girl. Our boys, our, our kids were a boy and a girl, which helped. So uh, the other couple slept in the, their bedroom. Darlene and I slept in the living room. The two girls slept in the second bedroom. And the two boys slept in the utility room. And we stayed that way for a month or two, something like that, until they were able to move upstairs into this uh, home, uh, which they had bought, but they had to wait for the people to move out before they could move in to that room. So anyway, we could share a lot of experiences, uh, but I, I just wanted to deal with one. Uh, Moody at that time was a three-year school. I finished those three years. I graduated from Moody, and, and we had been looking, okay, Lord, what would you have us to do? And he seemed to be leading us to go to Colorado, to Western Bible College, for me to finish my degree out there. And so I, as soon as I graduated from Moody, I started looking for a job. God provided that job, and I can't tell that story because it would take too long today to go through all the details, but God provided me with a job working at Sears Warehouse because I just needed something temporary until we could get to Colorado. But we needed money to get to Colorado, and we didn't have any money. Uh, so I started working there, and then in, during the month of June, my sister's husband, who was 37, committed suicide. And they were in Pennsylvania, which is where Darlene and I are from. And we got a call, can you need to come home? to help your sister get through this difficulty. And I said, well, I'm really tied up right now. I don't think I can do that. We started praying about it. And then the next day I got a second call saying, Ken, you have to come home. Your sister is very, very distraught and she needs you. So I was uh, planned to preach at a church that Sunday. So I tried calling the deacon of that church. When I called, he answered the phone right away. And I said, hi, this is Ken Howe. Uh, I've got a problem. He said, that's okay, Ken, because i got the solution. And I said, how can you have the solution when I even told you what my problem is? He said, well, the reason I'm saying that is because I was just sitting here by the phone looking for your phone number to call you. So he said, tell me what your problem is. And I said, well, they would like me to go home to Pennsylvania to do the funeral service for my sister's husband and to spend some time counseling my sister. And if I do that, I can't preach at the church this Sunday. And he said, great, I got the answer. He says, the missionary who was supposed to come the following week is ahead of schedule and would like to preach this Sunday. Could you come the following week? I said, sure, be glad to. So we went to Pennsylvania, Darlene and I. We spent a week there. And it worked out well, by the way. My sister did come to know the Lord through all that. Uh, but her and I both lost one week's worth of work, which was we needed every penny we could get to make it to Colorado. So I knew we were probably going to end up being short of money to Colorado. So we just kept, we went back to work. We kept working. We got closer and closer. And finally, the... Friday before we were to leave, 
I went to the bank, closed out our accounts, calculated up all our money, and I had already figured out how much it was going to cost us to get to Colorado because we had to rent a U-Haul truck. So she was going to drive the car with one of our kids. I was going to drive the truck with the other one. We were going to stop at a motel on the way. And we had a name and an address and a phone number of a couple at the school I was going to go to. They were students there, and they had a two-bedroom apartment, and they said they could help us get set up. Well, it was a small two-bedroom apartment, I can tell you that. And they had two kids also, so there's that same problem again. But anyway, I calculated it out. If we could get to Colorado, what it would cost to get there, and then not staying with them, but maybe just living in a tent for a month in a state park, what that would cost. And I came up $350 short of having enough money to do that. Now, $350 is something to remember if you can. Anyway, on Saturday, I went to U-Haul reserved the truck to pick it up on Monday morning, gave them a down payment. The U-Haul truck was going to cost $800, which was most of our cash. And then on Sunday, we went to church. And the church was about the same as this one, about the same number of people. And just before the offering, the head deacon stood up and says, as you know, the Howes are leaving us this week, and we've decided the entire offering this morning will go to them. The offering that morning was $349.76. Praise God, right? It was just another affirmation from God that that's what he wanted us to do. And when I mentioned that to somebody, he said, well, apparently you don't need that 24 cents, Ken. <laughs> you know, so we, we, we got to Colorado. We got to this couple's apartment, which was um, on the college campus. And they had two small children that uh, were not well controlled. Let's just put it that way. And we decided we couldn't stay here anymore in one night. That was it. And the next day I went to the school, bulletin board, and they said, well, we just had a posting for a new job. Uh, maybe you could go check it out. So I did. I ended up getting that job. And then we started looking for an apartment. We couldn't find any apartment in our financial situation that we could afford. But this couple we were staying with said, hey, we looked at the house. It might work for you guys. It wouldn't work for us. So we checked out that house, and it was perfect for us. And it was right across the street from our high school because both our kids were going to high school at that time. And uh, we, we moved in. And it's just amazing to me when you think about it, to go that far hardly know anybody other than that name and address and phone number and end up with a job and a home in less than 24 hours. God was leading us. There was no doubt about it. And he continues to lead us even today. And I could stand up here and talk until you didn't want to hear me anymore of stories just exactly that way of how God has led us throughout our life. And he's leading us right now. He led us to come here. And I praise God for that. I just praise the Lord for his leading in our lives. And I pray that you have that leading in your lives, that you're trusting the Lord. Because I can tell you, when we was at Moody and I graduated, Colorado, where's Colorado? You know, We've never been there. We, had no, we hadn't been west of the Mississippi River. We'd grown up in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and of course, when we grew up, you didn't go out of Pennsylvania. That was you just stayed there. So even Chicago was a distance. But uh, to go to Colorado, wow! But that's where he led us, and he provided whatever we needed to make it there. And I just praise God for that. And so I'd like us to sing just a chorus of a song in your hymn books, number five hundred and forty-three. So, through it all, and, and the words in that hymn are just fabulous, and, and it'd be great to sing them all, but we just don't have the time, so I thought maybe we'd just do the chorus. I'm going to ask Norma, Norma, will you just play through the entire chorus? After she plays through the chorus, then we'll sing just the chorus, okay?
Uh, I assume most of you know that song, I hope, because I'm not a singer. And I'm going to get away from this microphone because you don't want to hear me, I'm telling you, okay? But uh, if we could, Norma, let's play. I hope you've learned that as well, because God is so good. He just never stops with his grace and his mercy in our lives. Sure, him no. A long ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible say, Mary's man child Jesus Christ was born on Christmas Day. Hark now, hear the angels sing, a new king born today, and man shall live forevermore. Because of Christmas Day. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. And you can join us on the fourth verse if you want. Come, desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness now we face. Stamp thy image in its place. Second Adam from above, reign in us in thy love. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you. 
I had the day off, but now they put. Uh, I'm here to to tell you that we're going to take the offering now, and let's let's pray about that. Uh, this is a time of year, Lord, when our hearts turn to gift giving and loving um, expressions of love to our family and friends. But Lord, that's something we should be doing all the time. Our hearts should be turned to you continuously throughout the year. And we just thank you, Lord, because we're just giving you back what you have given us. Ken told us this, some of his life there that shows us that you're in control, that you're working in our lives every day. Help us to appreciate that and remember that. And be generous not only here at church, but, well, I shouldn't have said that, but be generous to our family and friends, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. We'll wait for you tomorrow morning offering them. I get goofed up, don't I? On the screen, or well, come on, sir, you got to come up here. Oh, I guess. You waiting for the screen? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm waiting for the. Just throw me under the bus. <laughs> okay. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's why I muted that. That would have been a really bad sound if that wasn't muted. This morning, if you've got a Bible with you, we're going to be looking at some various portions of Scripture, but we'll start off um, with the very first chapter of the Bible in Genesis. So you can kind of find your place there because eventually we will start in Genesis chapter 1. For those of you who are OCD, I'm going to pick that up, okay? So that's not bothering you the whole time. So Genesis chapter 1 is what we'll be starting at, particularly verse um, 27. At this time of the year, a lot of people find themselves uh, putting up a lot more pictures on the front of their refrigerators, don't they? Usually it's those, you're starting to get those in the mail of the family photos, right? And you, sometimes they fill up the front of that refrigerator. And you look at those family photos and you think, boy, they did a great job. Look at how everybody's smiling. Look at how happy that family is. But we often don't think of what took place prior to that perfect picture, if you will, and to set that up and to kind of give you an idea of what that might look like, let me show you a little video. I just want one nice photo. Look, 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 look at your show. Look at your show right there. Oh, look, train jobs. 
Every year, I get card after card after card in the mail of these beautiful family Christmas photos. Why can't I have that? Where's my family photo? Five big smiles. Ready, sir? I don't get why we have to spend $600 to pay some Chotsky for something that we do every single day ourselves. Look at this, 128 gigs, nothing but photos of our kids. Theo, come back. Theodore. Buddy, come here, please. Theo, you can play Theodore, with this picture later. Let's get your old buddy. Ashley has a nice photo. Karen has a nice photo. I just want a nice photo. You should just take pictures of the chaos. That represents our family. Oh, like that's, 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 no, that's not. That's not there, you that's get on my back. No, you get on my back. Put that in their hallway. Is that too much to ask? One nice photo of your family for Christmas? It's Christmas time. Santa's coming. He's supposed to be the best photographer in town. For what we're paying him, he better be the best in town. All right, look what I'm wearing. I'm wearing a hat. Who am I? Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho. I hate my life. Right at the Swiffer. Hey, yeah, listen. Right there, look at the Swiffer. No, I want to work for National Geographic, but I'm $65,000 in debt, and I live in the garage behind my ex-girlfriend's bungalow. Do you know you can't touch the camera, baby? Okay. Juniper! When your kids are between the ages of one and seven, you just shouldn't take family photos. It's not worth it. Just all of us looking at the camera, all of us smiling. Yes, and I'm trying to help you get that, okay? No, just you get... want to make a silly photo, and we're not doing... I used to work at Quiznos. I miss working at Quiznos. I That's perfect. Just there we go. This. Okay. Shoot this, ready? Okay. Ready? Uh, smile, Heidi. Here's smile. The, Get in the photo and the, smile. Uh, here we go. Uh, you guys, open, open up these presents. Open it up. Almost had it. I, I hate all holidays, really. I do like Groundhog Day. Open it and smile. Rip it smile, off. Theo, smile. There it is. There's a smile right here. Oh! All right. I think we got it. <laughs> uh... Car was full. Oh. The fact of the matter is, this season of Christmas doesn't look or seem like those tranquil pictures that we put up on the front of our refrigerators, does it? Or those manger scenes that we might think of where everybody's calm and it's still. That's not the way that it looks like at our house sometimes, is it? And it certainly doesn't look like those Norman Rockwell Christmas paintings. So some of you might be like, who's Norman Rockwell? Well, you'll have to look that up when you get home. Not only does this time of the year bring stress with it, but it also brings discontentment. I believe that we live in a culture that is soaked in discontentment. We're surrounded by it, and we even ourselves are professionals at it. When we think about our lives, when we think about Christmas time, no other holiday gets the attention like Christmas does, does it, during the year? And it seems like people prep for this earlier and earlier every year. From Christmas in July to radio, radio, stations, radio stations and stations in the stores that we go into starting Christmas music immediately after trick-or-treating's over with to Christmas trees being put up even before the Halloween candy is out of the store. It seems like more and more this narrative is being pushed that this is the year that you're going to find fulfillment. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it bigger, we're going to make it longer, we're going to make it more attractive, because let's face it, life stinks, especially during the pandemic. That's the message that's conveyed. 
This message that this is the year that you're finally going to find fulfillment. So we'll make the sales longer. We'll make them seem better. And we'll start them earlier. Thanksgiving meal with the family? Bah, that's a thing of the past. Let's all line up at Walmart on Black Friday morning and trample each other over and slug each other in the face to get that TV that's on sale for two hours. Doesn't that sound like a lot more fun than carving the turkey? That's the message that's conveyed. Sometimes it's not always stuff that's conveyed as to what we may need. Sometimes it's Clark Griswold. Having the whole family there. Lights are perfect. Light snow is falling outside. That turkey is cooked to perfection. The message once again is this is the year that we're going to find fulfillment. This is the year that it's going to be perfect. Everything I've been waiting for is finally going to happen. And for whatever reason, people push all of their chips in every year for this. And fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. Now, don't get me wrong here. I think we should enjoy all of the nostalgia, uh, the traditions, the family time, and being smart with our finances and taking advantage of those good sales that do happen. But the point that I want to make is to not get caught up in the things and don't buy into the lies that leave us frustrated and disappointed in the end rather than focusing on what actually matters and what this season is all about. It's not about how many presents you have underneath that tree or what's in those presents. It's not about getting the greatest deal that you could get. It's not finding that perfect Christmas tree or even having everybody get along. For those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, we need to remember what we hear so often. He is the reason for the season. So with all of that, let's look at some scriptures to dig into what I want to talk about this morning. First, once again, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, I want to start at verse 27. All of the scriptures here I'm going to be reading this morning are coming from the English Standard Version. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You and I have been made in the image of God. And even though everything else in all of creation declares the glory of God, as human beings, you and I have a unique and brilliant reflection of the glory of God. More than anything else in all of creation. Since God made us in his image, there are certain distinct things inside of us that that in many ways create different pathways that we either walk in for our ultimate good and salvation or not. That leads me to this gap that is inside of us that I want to start talking about today. For this, our focus mainly is going to be on the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you turn to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I want to look at verse 11. Now, if you're unfamiliar with where in your Bible Ecclesiastes is, find the middle of your Bible, which should be the book of Psalms, and then move little by little towards the back of your Bible. And a few, ch- a few books after Psalms, you will find the little book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Now, if you're unfamiliar with your Bible, the big numbers are chapters, and the little numbers are verses. So chapter 3 will be the big 3, and then verse 11 will be the little number 11. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. This is what I want to spend the majority of our time thinking about today, where he says this phrase here, Solomon is the one who writes this, and he says the, this phrase, he has put eternity into man's heart. Maybe you've heard this said before. I think there was a song that came out quite a few years ago that uh, the title of it or a phrase in it said, there's a God-shaped hole in, inside of us. Anybody hear something on, the, on those lines or maybe uh, heard it phrased a different way like that? But that's the truth. Because what's being conveyed is what's said here that at the core, at the core of, of who you and I are, at the core of that, there is a gap of eternity that we have a longing to have filled. Now, unfortunately, what many, many of us do is we seek to fill that gap of eternity with something or someone that has either no eternal significance or is temporary. And what is temporary will never fill the gap of eternity. But here's the deceptive thing about that. If you're listening, say amen. Here's the deceptive thing about why or, or those things that we try to fill that gap of eternity with. The temporary stuff does work for a while. It may make us happy for a while. And even though temporary things can be good, they can also be made into idols. And they will eventually let us down. Think about a teenager, for example. How teenagers want more freedom from mom and dad. And then that teenager maybe gets it. And then they want a car. And so then maybe they get that car. And then they want to get out of the house. So they graduate from high school. They either go into the workforce or go to college and they get out of the house. They're out of mom, underneath, from underneath mom and dad's wings. They get what they want. Then they want that perfect career. Then they want that spouse because life just isn't as fun living it alone. So they get married. Then they want the kids that all obey at everything that you say. And maybe they get that. I don't know that that's possible, but maybe they get that. Then they want that house. Then they want that car. And the list goes on and on and on. And at every turn, they get maybe what they want. And it's great for a while. But then they become dissatisfied. And that's the thing. When we want what we want and maybe get what we want, it may be great for a while. But it does not fill that gap of eternity. Many people have the idea that if they can find Mr. Perfect or Miss Perfect, that that's going to fulfill what they feel like they're missing in their life. This is why adultery takes place even in marriages. They think that maybe the grass is greener in the other pasture. So they get married. And they place this individual on that pedestal or, or set the bar so high for that individual to meet something that they were never created to meet. I know I felt that way. I wanted to be married for so long. In fact, I made it an idol in my life from the time I was 18 until I got married when I was 30. I wouldn't admit that it was an idol. I was asked by a pastor are you sure you're not making this an idol in your life? And of course I'd say, no, of course not. But I was so ready to be married. I was ready to say I do before her dad, who was one of the officiants of our wedding, said, do you take this woman to be your bride? But 
But for those of us that are married, we know that after we say those I do's, there are days in our marriage where we realize that marriage takes work. Married people don't leave me hanging, right? (laughs) 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 Marriage does take work. And then we, the, the, the kids, we want the kids. And so the, we, you know, maybe plan for that. I remember before having one of our kids, this marriage material was shared. And, and I don't know, if, I don't remember if Stacy was sharing this marriage material with me or, or if I just happened to come across it. And, and I'm just thinking, you know, man, to carry a little, little being in my hand, uh, uh, made in the image of, I drop things all the time. So I'm thinking, man, I'm going to be carrying this precious little baby in my hand. And there was reading material, and I'm I'm reading through this reading material, and I'm thinking, this is stupid. This is a load of garbage. These, These people who wrote these books, they have weird babies. They got babies that are, that come out smoking a pipe and watching Masterpiece Theater. Well, that wasn't Strickfaden babies. Babies, so Strickfaden babies rolled out like Rambo with a machine gun and a scar ready for a fight. That was, that was a Strickfaden babies that felt like, you know, at least that's what it felt like for being a parent. Now, as much as my, I love my wife, as much as I love my three kids, I know that they cannot fill the gap of eternity in my heart that was created for only God to fill. In fact, I would argue that almost every dark chapter in human history, almost every dark chapter of your life and mine, every act of rebellion against God could be boiled down to this gap of eternity in our hearts that we try to take temporary things and jam it in with the hopes that it will satisfy us indefinitely. And the cycle goes on. That we don't receive the satisfaction that maybe we were hoping, or it doesn't last. It fades. So we look for something or someone to replace it. Turn back in your Bible, same book of Ecclesiastes, to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I want to start at verse 2 here. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting at verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil? at which he toils under the sun. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The idea that the writer here is trying to get across to us in the pursuit of these things that, try, that we try to fill that gap of eternity in our hearts with, we see that there's always a chasing after more. Never being fully satisfied. And it's into this sort of madness that a child was born, that a son was given, and the government was to rest upon his shoulders. It's into this sort of madness that Christ was born. A divine invasion begins, and Jesus is going to solve this problem of this gap of eternity. And it's not only that, But he's going to solve the problem of what you and I have with stuff. And more importantly, he's going to solve the problem of how our sin separated us from a holy God. He was going to provide the only way back to God. That's what Jesus did. 
Ecclesiastes 1.8 says, Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. That is from the New Living Translation. Sometimes I like these newer translations and how they word things because it's so true. No, no matter how much we hear, we are not content. So Jesus came to fill that gap of eternity. For this, let's move on to what I want to close with today. John chapter 1. We're going to move to the New Testament here. John chapter 1, starting at verse 1. John chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Two things that I want to point out here. First, in verse 1. This verse here just told us that Jesus is not a creation of God, but rather is God. Always has been and always will be. And if Christ reigns and rules in our heart and life, then he fills that gap of eternity. Let me show you another scripture. Hold your place here, but turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians 1, verse 27 says this, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the hope of gl the glory that God did not leave us on our own. He didn't leave us in our sins and transgressions and our iniquity, but rather invaded he didn't leave us broken with this gap of eternity in us as believers, but came as a baby, lived, died, was resurrected to fill that gap of eternity and set us free. Now, back to first, or John chapter 1. The second thing that I want to point out here is verses 3 and 4. Look at these verses again. All things were made through him, and without him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So not only does John tell us that Jesus shows up to fill in this gap of eternity with, it, with himself, but we also see that he is the creative agent in all of creation. And not only that, if that wasn't great enough as it was, we also read that Jesus didn't possess, just possess life, but rather he's the source of it. It can be so easy for us to, for, to wrap ourselves up in people, in, in things that either treat us or them as if we don't matter. For the longest time, as I told you a little bit ago, from 18 to 30, I wrapped myself up in wanting to be married. And I felt like my life would not be complete until God brought Stacy into my life. Now that I'm married and have been married for over 10 years, as much as Stacy is a part of me, as much as she is more than what I prayed for in a woman, as much as I love her, as much as I would lay down my life for her in a second and not even think twice about it, she's not my life. That can only be reserved for Christ. 
Maybe for you, it's not your spouse that you've wrapped up your identity in. Maybe it's your image. Maybe it's your reputation. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your ability to provide financially for your family. Maybe it's your intellect. Or especially at this time of the year, maybe it's perfection. The house has to be perfect before anybody can step foot inside this house. And we spend countless hours making sure that the house is perfect. Not even thinking about knowing that when our family comes over, it's always just an insult wrapped in a compliment away from a hand grenade going off in your living room. So life isn't about finding our identity in any of these things or in any of these people. It is found in finding purpose or meaning and life in Jesus Christ. That gap of eternity in our hearts and our lives has been a gap that God knew could only be filled with himself. Even before he created Adam and Eve. So as we prepare to celebrate with our families, with our friends, with whoever we might be celebrating with this Christmas season, let's be reminded that God in his great love for us, didn't abandon us in the gap of eternity, but invaded it by sending his son to be born in a manger, live a life that we couldn't live of perfection, die a death that we deserved, rose in the power of the Holy Spirit to provide life and to fill what we all are longing for with himself and himself alone. Granted, he has given us other things and blessed us with other individuals, but he alone is the only one can, that can fill that gap of eternity now and forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, with as many things that are around us that pull us away from you, we can be deceived into believing that something or someone can fulfill us in a way that they were never created or it was never created to do. You and you alone give life. You and you alone are what we need. If there's someone sitting here today or watching online that you are pulling to come to know you, I pray they surrender their lives to you. For those of us that are here or watching online that do know you, Help us to not be deceived into believing that you're not enough. Help us not to be deceived in thinking, is this all that there is? Feeling as if we need more than just you. I don't know what's going on in the hearts and the lives of the individuals that sit here or are or watching this on their computer. But you do, Lord. You are sovereign over all, and I pray, Lord, that you will fill us with yourself, that you will set our eyes on you, on the majesty, on the beauty it is to know you as Lord and Savior. You are more than enough. Lord, I pray that that's something that, that we don't just say so flippantly, 
but that through your Holy Spirit that we feel and know. And so I pray all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.